Hi, I'm Sam Landsman from Slowboat.com. And I'm Laura Domela from Slowboat.com. Today, we're going to be talking about getting to the San Juan Islands from the south. So, from the Puget Sound area, there are really three different routes you can take to get to the San Juan Islands. Yeah, and each of these routes has pluses and minuses. We'll talk about more of that coming up. But the first possibility is taking the outside Whidbey Island route. The other option is to go inside Whidbey Island and through Deception Pass, or a variation of that, go inside Whidbey Island and then through Sunamish Channel and out Guimas Channel towards the San Juan Islands. Okay, so the route that takes us on the outside of Whidbey Island is the shortest and the most direct. And the reason I like this direction is so we can stop in Port Townsend because I love that town. Yeah, Port Townsend is an excellent stop. There's a lot of nautical history and heritage there. Got the Northwest Maritime Center. The and wooden boat festivals there. Yep, yeah, that's where the start of the race to Alaska is, the human-powered trip up the Inside Passage. There's a lot to like about Port Townsend, great marinas right in town. Okay, so what are the downsides of this route? One of the big ones is Admiralty Inlet has a lot of current. And you also have to then go across the Strait of Juan de Fuca to the San Juan Islands, which is exposed to wind. And when you get these issues working against each other, so you get the current against the wind, you end up with really nasty seas that stack up close together, white cap breaking, horrible <laughs> places you don't want to be. Terrible, terrible conditions. <laughs> yeah, the worst part is up at Point Wilson, which is right north of Port Townsend. You're heading out of Admiralty Inlet into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and the worst conditions are on an ebb, and then you have a westerly wind coming in. And the two of those collide, and Point Wilson gets to be really, really ugly. Okay, what are some of the resources that will help people prepare for dealing with the problem areas for this route? There are four forecast areas that are going to be useful in a trip up the outside route. You start in Puget Sound, and then you can work your way up to the Admiralty Inlet forecast, then the Strait of Juan de Fuca East Entrance forecast for once you get north of Admiralty Inlet, and then into the San Juan Islands forecast zone. Cool, and there are some other resources. Yeah, there are a couple of weather buoys that are useful in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Smith Island and New Dungeness weather buoys, so you can pull up real-time wind conditions wave conditions and so forth. So those can give you a great idea of what's actually happening out there right now. That's super Sitting helpful. Sitting on, on the forecast looks maybe like it's a little marginal and you're questioning whether to leave Port Townsend. Pull up those buoy reports and see what kind of conditions you can actually look at right now out there. I just learned about ferry weather. Ferry weather, the link is up here. You can look at live streaming weather data from Washington State Ferries. And then so each ferry reports as they're around in the islands? It'll give you the, how recent the report was, the direction of the wind and wind cool. speed. It won't give you sea state, for instance, but wind speed and direction is a useful tool. And then Wonderground. Wonderground.com, they have a good map where you can pull up all sorts of wind stations and they'll show you what direction and velocity the wind is going. That's super helpful in building a picture of what's going on in the whole route you're about to go through. Great. Also, mornings tend to be calmer in this area. Yeah, especially in the summer, mornings tend to be the better time of day to be out crossing the bigger water. That's not always the case, so nope. you, you might not have that be the case. And you don't want to get so locked into thinking that mornings are the only time. It's a short distance across. We're only talking 20, 25 miles. And so maybe the evening is a better time. And don't be afraid to seize an opportunity when it presents itself, whether that's morning or evening. Also fog. But fog usually means it's calm. Right. So if you're proficient using radar and AIS and GPS and so forth, you can use the fog to your advantage. Do be aware that the whole Strait of Juan de Fuca area is heavily used by commercial traffic. So right. know where the VTS lanes are and stay clear of them, particularly in the fog. All right, now let's talk about the inside Whidbey Island route. It's a bit more protected than the outside route. It's got some fun places to stop as well. Langley, Coopville. Yeah, it is a better protected route generally. And there are these good stops that you mentioned. Oak Harbor is another good stop. And Oak Harbor is often some of the cheapest diesel in Puget Sound. So if you're needing to fill up on your way to or from, it might be a good option. I don't know why the last few times we've been down, it happens to be on the day that they're closed. <laughs> <laughs> Unlucky. I know. <laughs> so what are the challenges people face when taking the inside route here? There still are the, currents. The big challenge about. here is Deception Pass. And Deception Pass has currents to about eight, sometimes nine knots, which is frightening to people. But the good news is it's very predictable. So you know exactly when it's going to be running and when it's not. And a little more about Deception Pass. So the currents run to eight or nine knots. They ebb west and they flood east. And the caution here is really once you're outside of Deception Pass, if there's a southerly breeze and an ebb current, it's going to get nasty. There's a tide rip right outside of Deception Pass, and it just is kind of like a washing machine. Everywhere else around might be relatively calm, and the waves just stack up right outside of Deception Pass. The bridge that you'll go under at Deception Pass has 144 feet of clearance, so that's not too much of an issue generally for recreational boats. And 
if you get to Deception Pass too early or too late, there's a good state park right in Cornet Bay. Your way up, you can pull in there, there's a dock, there's space to anchor, and you can just wait it out until a safe time to transit. Okay, and how will I know when it's a safe time to transit? Well, you'll want to look in the tide guides, and so there's a whole bunch of way to access tidal data now. You'll want to make sure that whatever you're using is accurate. So the best way to do that is to reference it off of the NOAA official predictions, and you can buy these in paper form or you can download them on the internet. You'll want to just make sure you're round slack at Deception Pass. Most boats have enough power that they can get through even if it's not right at slack. A good rule of thumb is don't go through when the current is running more than one third of your maximum boat speed. Oh, that's great. Okay. So if you have a boat that's capable of doing, say, 18 knots, the maximum velocity you'd want to ever be out in is about six knots. This, of course, is once you're experienced in these conditions. So as a new boater or somebody that's going through for the first time. You just want to follow the rules. Go, go at slack or, <laughs> yeah. or plus or minus. 30 minutes. There are lots of things that happen much more quickly, potentially if you're going through with a current running. If you have any kind of mechanical problem, you have less time to deal with it and you might just get spit out somewhere. If there are logs coming at you or logs that have been sucked down, it's easier to hit them. If there are other boats in Deception Pass, it's harder to maneuver. So new boaters or less experienced boaters should definitely go at slack water. Okay. And again, what are the resources that'll help people prepare for dealing with the problem areas here? So we have, again, the same NOAA forecast actually as if you go up on the outside of Whidbey Island. Even though you're more protected from the Strait of Juan de Fuca, you still are going to be going across right where the Strait of Juan de Fuca and Rosario Strait meet up. And so the weather for that area will be somewhere related to the San Juan Islands and Strait of Juan de Fuca east entrance weather forecast, kind of a blend of the two probably. In big southerly weather, that's a nasty area. The Smith Island and New Dungeness weather buoys, again, will be useful. They'll be able to tell you what is happening a little bit out further into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Ferry weather will give you a picture of what's happening between Muckleteo and Clinton on Whidbey Island. And then Wonderground again. You can pull up that map, the Wonder Map, they call it, and you can put different layers on there, including wind speed and direction, and build a picture of what's going on the, the whole route. One other resource for currents is a Canadian Hydrographic Service publication called the Current Atlas. You use these in conjunction with annual tables. So you buy the Current Atlas one time, you buy the tables every year. The tables are done by the Wagner Group, so they're called the Wagner Current Tables. And the Canadian publication just has a map of the... The direction, right? Yeah, is it basically it? has a map of the whole San Juan Island and Gulf Island area, and then a whole bunch of arrows, and it has about 50 different scenarios of flooding and it's ebbing. It's pretty cool, yeah. And so that doesn't help you find the specific time of slack right. at any given point, but it shows you visually what the current's doing over a big area. Which is uh, nice to know. For and planning it, a trip, it's super useful. Yeah. My preferred tide guide, because I'm going all the way up to Alaska every year, is called Ports and Passes, and that is the official government data from both the Canadians and the Americans, so you know it's accurate, and it's easy to use as well. It's been adjusted for daylight savings time and so forth. And then most electronic charting systems also have tides and current functionality built in. Most of the time this works very well, but I should warn people that I've had enough cases where the tidal data has yep. been way off to doubt that. And if it's somewhere the boat really, you need to make sure they're at Slack, then check the official paper resources or internet resources. It's a really good idea to have several resources to work yeah, from. If they differ by a few minutes, it's no big deal. It's just but a, a slightly different model. But <laughs> Two hours is going to make a big difference in the amount of current right. uh, velocity that you have. All right. So the third and longest route is the inside Woodby Island and Swinomish Channel route. It's nice if you want to stop in Laconner, which is a cute town with some fun shops and good restaurants, right? Yeah, Laconner is a great town. Also, if you're heading to Anacortes, this is a good route to take. Faster. Yep, it's faster than coming around and coming inside Guimas, but it is the longest route. And Swinomish Channel is an area that requires some care. Deception Pass is short. You get through it in a couple of minutes and you're done. Swinomish Channel is an hour or two long to get through it. And the currents run to several knots. This is not really too much of an issue from a navigational perspective, except for it can really slow you down. Right. But you really need to be aware of this when you're docking, if you're docking in Laconner. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> <laughs> there was no property damage, I'm sure. There was no property damage. It was just a little bit of ego. <laughs> but it's not uncommon to have two, three knots of current, particularly the outer part of the marine in Laconner. And I'll tell you, you need to remember, if there's current and you want to dock, you need to dock against the current, not with the current. 
three knots of extra boat speed going into into the marinas. A little too dramatic for my taste. Larger sailboats need to be aware for a couple reasons. One, it's shallow through here, particularly on low tides. There might only be eight to ten feet of water, which is pretty skinny for a sailboat that draws seven or eight feet. There's uh, a bridge, and there's also right? the bridge, there right? Two bridges. There's a rainbow bridge just south of Laconer, mm. and then there's the swing bridge, which is open most of the time, just as you go up into Padilla Bay. But that Padilla. rainbow bridge in Laconer has a seventy-five foot vertical clearance. Okay, I'm gonna call Padilla. Does everybody really say Padilla? I can't ever say Padilla because I know it's local and all that, but I always am going to call it Padilla Bay. Just From hole in the wall up to the swing bridge, you have to go at no wake speed. And it's very tempting when you see the crab guys going out at maximum wake making speed in front of the marina to follow suit. But please keep your hands off the throttle. The wakes can really wreak havoc on the marina and Laconer. The other thing to keep in mind here, a couple other things. One, the south end of the channel is really, really unforgiving. This is before you get to hole in the wall on your way in. On the north side of that channel, they've dredged it and there's a riprap, stone, nasty kind of dike holding the sediment out of the main channel. And just a few feet out of the channel and you'll hit that dike. And at most water levels, you can't see it. On the other side, on the north end of the channel, if you veer out of the channel, you tend to just end up in the mud. On the south side, you end up on this horrible dike, which has been job security for many years for the folks in Laconer, but you don't want to find yourself sitting high and dry on that. The other thing to remember is there's a buoyage change in the middle of Swinomish Channel, and they actually changed where this point is, so it switched from red right returning. They said you were returning to the midpoint. Right. And they switched this point a few years ago. They moved it south by several miles. And so you want to make sure you have updated electronic charts on board and really know where you are. Some people like to mark off the buoys on a paper chart as they work their way through. It's very well marked, but you just need to be paying attention and not cut any corners. Okay, and resources to help with this transit are basically the same. Yeah, you're gonna use the same forecasts because you're more protected, you don't go outside at Deception Pass. That tide rip is not a concern anymore. But we have a new challenge, and that's going to be, for most people, heading out Guimas Channel, where you get current to several knots again, and that can slow you down or speed you up. But the real hazard is when you get that wind blowing against that current, and then the seas stack up. And I've had, actually, I think the worst weather that I've ever encountered in 3,000 hours of boating around the Pacific Northwest was in Guimas Channel one winter. Seriously? With 40-something knots of wind against three knots of current, and it was just horrible. Ugh. So use caution there. Most of the time it's not a big deal, but it's something to be aware of. Okay, and then also Rosario Strait can be problematic. Yeah, so if we're heading into the San Juans now, you're going to have to go across Rosario Strait. And Rosario Strait is a lot smaller than some of the other straits around, but it can be just as nasty. There's a lot of current moving through here. The current runs north and south generally, but you have all these passes in the San Juans dumping current into the strait, and you have Guimas Channel dumping current in. Waves coming from all different directions without any clear path. They're stacking up all over the place. And so if the wind is really blowing, try to time your trip across to coincide with near slack water it'll be a much calmer trip that way. So all the passes can be nasty. Cattle Pass because it opens south between San Juan Island and Lopez Island. It's not uncommon to have three knots of current ebbing out of there and 25, 30 knots of wind coming up from the south. Yep. And the waves just stack up there. It's unbelievable. Yeah, we've had some pretty fun, dramatic crossings of Cattle Pass. And Thatcher Pass, similarly, the passes over there don't get quite as bad as Cattle Pass, but Thatcher Pass has the most traffic. The Washington State Ferries typically are using Thatcher Pass. And isn't it fairly narrow? It's narrow. It's not narrow enough that it would cause any problem mm -hmm. uh, for boats that are passing. I just passing. mean for traffic, like ferries. And yeah, like, mm -hmm. Give the ferry space and just be aware, especially if it's foggy, that there's going to be a lot of traffic in there. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you're ready to head up to the San Juan Islands now. We're actually recording this from a boat in the San Juan Islands right now. If you have any questions, just let us know. We're always happy to answer. And we hope you make it up to the San Juans and check out our video about cruising in the San Juans. And thanks for joining us. To see more of our educational boating videos, subscribe to our Slow Boat YouTube channel. If you're on Facebook, you can follow us at facebook.com slash slowboatlife. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at slowboatlife. And of course, you can always find us on slowboat.com. Until next time, see you on the water.